Yeah. Steve. Yes, we're just going to pretend that you're in the witness protection program, okay? Well, does that mean oh my that God. I have to talk like this to disguise my voice so people won't know who I really am? That would be okay. wonderful, well, I was but... Going... I think it was Kermit the Frog who taught us that it's not easy being a green screen. And we're finding that out. Although there's a chance yes. that people out there, all those people out there in the dark are actually seeing us, even though we can't see each other for professional reasons. They are. He, so and let's go ahead as thing, if it were audio Steve. only, and I'll try not to like pick my nose or something. Well, here's the thing, Steve. I'm looking at the feed mm. on my phone, and I can, I can see yes. you perfectly sitting in front of some books. I cannot see I can't me, see you so. either. Are you doing your Claude Rains right. impression? Yeah, I guess I don't even need to put a shirt on. This is great. Um, so, yes, the, the audience, it looks like, can see you. They know what I look like, so it doesn't even matter. Um, perfect. So, yes, Steve, sir. how was your weekend? It was Welcome fine, aboard. uneventful. Uh, um, I do. I put in a, a, a four-mile uh, four walk every day just to air my brain out so I don't get too much... Um, cabin fever and i actually saw two sure. live skunks on some uh, on some grassy area foraging for food i'd never seen them in the wild before i stayed a safe distance away but it was kind of neat here in you know i live in los angeles and it's hardly uh grassy knolls and trees as far as the eye can see but there was i presume mr and mrs skunk Pepe Le Pew and his wife, uh, big as life. So that was wow. kind of cool. I don't know if that's good luck or not, but let, let's take it as such. It was good luck that I didn't get sprayed with stench. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll call that a win for <laughs> sure. Um, so if you'd like, Steve, why don't you take a moment, introduce yeah. yourself, let everyone know a little bit about yourself. I am, in fact, Steve Stolier. And uh, when I was in college at UCLA, I happened upon a dream job working for Groucho Marx inside his house for the last three years of his life. And it was, in fact, a dream job, literally, because I used to dream about meeting Groucho because I was so obsessed with him. Uh, I would dream that I was meeting him and asking for a souvenir cigar and then as the dream would dissolve and I woke up, I would think, damn, it was, I could, it was so tangible. I could feel it. I could see it. And it was just my brain. So uh, I really did um, have my dream come true. And the circumstances were that uh, there was a Marx Brothers film, still is as a matter of fact, called Animal mm -hmm. Crackers that had not been seen in decades because of a copyright uh, reversal of the rights um, snag that kept Universal from re-releasing the old Paramount film. And they didn't think there was an audience for seeing this basically lost film, uh, even though all my friends who were Marx Brothers fans had been clamoring to see it because it was just the, the great missing link in there. You know, they only made about a dozen sure. movies and this was the second one. And he played Captain Spaulding and uh, said one morning, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How he got in my pajamas, I don't know. And um, I started a petition drive and a committee at, at UCLA to pressure Universal into spending a little bit of money to clear up the rights and release the film. They saw no point in spending money on an old black and white Marx Brothers movie. And of course, this was years before, decades before TCM and streaming and DVDs where everything is out with bonus footage and all that sort of thing. It was just this old unseen for decades Marx Brothers movie. And uh, I got in touch with Aaron Fleming, who was the controversial woman in charge of Groucho's life at that time. And uh, she agreed to bring Groucho to UCLA and to alert the press. 
So there was this massive crush of students with their shaggy hair and uh, facial hair and mm -hmm. whatnot, all crowding in to hear Groucho, who was in his early 80s and in, in kind of frail health, chatting with me, I was 19, uh, about animal crackers. And it was just surreal. I said, Groucho, I'm very happy to be meeting you after all this time. And he said, well, you should be. And Aaron mm -hmm. Fleming said, this is Steve Stolyer. He's the one trying to get animal crackers re-released. And Groucho said, well, did you get it? And I said, not yet, but, but uh, we're working on it. And he said, you better or I'll fire you. And I said, I, I didn't realize I was working for you. How much are you paying me? And he said, a little mm -hmm. less than nothing. So we were off and running. And I couldn't believe that I was chatting with my hero. And uh, Universal relented and uh, cleared the rights problem and reissued the film. And it ended up breaking the house record at the UA Westwood near UCLA, which had been set by the French Connection a few years earlier. And it was very gratifying for me to see, well, to see the film out and to see that I wasn't crazy. It wasn't just my circle of friends, but many, many students lining down the block in Westwood to see this creaky old Marx Brothers movie. And then after I had a couple of summer jobs fall through, this was in 74, and I remain eternally grateful that those summer jobs fell through. Mm -hmm. And I felt I had nothing to lose. <clears throat> so I called Aaron Fleming and I said, is there anything at all that you think I might be able? And I was rewarded with this plum job of, of being Groucho's personal secretary and archivist for the last three years of his life. And I thought I might be working in a like a Wilshire Boulevard office building and would catch a glimpse of Groucho once a month when he came in to sign checks or something. She said, oh, no, there's a room at the house you can use for your office and you can make your own hours and come and go as you want. And and they were paying me money to drive to Groucho's house and just immerse myself ankle deep in photos and letters and scrapbooks and annotated scripts and all these. I mean, it was just delicious for me because I was such a Marx Brothers fan, especially Groucho. And then, of course, being able to get to know my hero uh, in his twilight years, um, I got to sit at the lunch table. There was no sense that, uh, you know, the help should eat in the kitchen. It was very egalitarian. So I would be able to sit and talk to Groucho about whatever was on his mind or my mind <clears throat> and got his firsthand stories about working in vaudeville and the people he knew and the things he saw, which was uh, fascinating for me as a history buff because he was born in 1890. So mm -hmm. he was, I mean, a literal Victorian. He was, I guess, I mean, even though he was in America, Victoria was still on the throne for another 11 years after he was born. I asked him how far back he remembered, and he said, I guess the Spanish-American War, which was 1898. Right. So here was this man whose firsthand memories went from before the Wright brothers to after the moon landing, which is a staggering chunk of American history. Um, yeah. And it just, and, and I got to meet so many people from his circle, both in front of and behind the cameras, um, uh, George Burns and Bob Hope and Mae West and S.J. Perelman and Nat Perrin and Jack Lemon and Steve Allen and just, and to meet them under comfortable circumstances because they figured if I'm inside the house, there must be a reason I'm there. Maybe I'm Groucho's grandson or something. So there was no snobbery Sure, there's no pretense. They don't have to be on stage. That, and they and they wouldn't be thinking, who's this punk? Uh, I don't know who this is. I'm not going to talk to him. But the other thing I noticed was that, at least with Groucho's circle of friends, they really were very down-to-earth and unassuming. Um, there was no, they, they had no star trip going on. It was actually, it was Aaron's friends who were the younger celebrities at the time they were the ones that could have an attitude about, you know, I don't think you realize who I am.
but the people who were were certifiable legends were very you know when george burns came to lunch uh the doorbell rang and i answered it and he looked up at me and smiled and said hi you want to live a long time become an actor you live to be an old man like groucho and me okay let's eat <laughs> and uh off we went and i watched the two of them talk about different vaudeville houses they played in the teens and 20s and this was right before the sunshine boys he hadn't done that yet because his best friend jack benny was in rehearsal to star opposite walter matthau and then benny got sick and died of pancreatic cancer and so burns was tapped to pinch hit for his friend and that led to that whole renewal of interest in george burns that led to oh god and all those latter films that he did before he passed away but i yeah. certainly knew him from from the burns and allen show and his early paramount films he told me about being in international house with wc fields and giving him a gag about a coffee cup and uh, a cup of coffee and something to dunk into it and he said fields took use the gag in the film and it was just you know just a remarkable experience for me to go through the downside of course was getting close to my hero as he's fading out and also putting up with aaron fleming's mercurial temper i had to do a lot of growing up and maturing in those three years to handle these egos but i wouldn't have traded any of it for the world and i never took any of it for granted uh, when the star line vans would stop outside i i always had one foot outside looking in knowing what it must be like for them to be looking at groucho's house sometimes i would if i were in the kitchen i would wave through the lattice work uh that was on the other side of the window and let them go back to you know milwaukee saying i, I think groucho marx waved at me i couldn't tell but somebody <laughs> waved at me because i was always the fan that was just this lucky I think one of the best compliments I get from people who've read Raised Eyebrows is, I hate you. And I love hearing that because they're saying, I would have given anything to have your experience. And uh, I would have hated me too if I'd heard about this kid that somehow stumbled into this job where he got, I mean, you don't even have to be a Marx Brothers fan. Whoever your hero is, whether it's a, sure. a singer or a sports figure or something, imagine thinking all I wanted was your autograph and a handshake. And instead you get three years, initially seven days a week, because it was during summer vacation and just immersing myself and becoming a part of the last chapter of his life as things got more contentious with different warring factions who were fighting over control of him, which is unfortunately an all too common occurrence when you're dealing with elderly wealthy celebrities yeah that's the short yeah. answer to your um, question yeah no that's fantastic um i'm gonna take one more shot here yeah so i still can't see either of us but you're on my phone so that's well, fine we're, we're going we're going with uh we're going with the solo steve show and me the embodied <laughs> voice um, so when you initially got this gig, um, w was there anything like, whether it was first impressions or just in that first couple days where you were like, holy shit, I, he's completely different than I anticipated, or I didn't think I'd be doing this or seeing this. Well, the doing, didn't think I'd be doing or seeing this was almost a constant because I just, I, I it took so long to adjust to the fact that I, I wasn't going to wake up from this and mm -hmm. it was really happening. In terms of it, either disillusioned or, or expectations versus reality, it actually was a positive because a couple of years before I got the job, when Groucho was touring in his one-man show, uh, he was at Carnegie Hall and a few other places, I went to see him at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles in December of 72. And I wasn't prepared for how much of a toll time had taken on him. 
It's as if the press had conspired to perpetuate the idea that good old Groucho at, at 81, 82, just as sharp as ever. So I was expecting to see basically the host, the host of You Bet Your Life with somewhat grayer, whiter hair and mustache um, yeah. come out and be himself and be wonderful. And instead, this old frail man shuffled out and was reading off three by five cards. And it was like being hit in the gut with a sledgehammer because here was this guy that I'd been so desperate to see. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, the the Groucho that I thought I knew is for all intents and purposes gone. And then uh, when I got to know him in his house, I got to realize how much of the old Groucho, not the old Groucho, but the old Groucho was still there. The sense of humor, the ability to twist uh, lines and hand them back. Uh, that somehow in the comfort of his home, just sitting at the lunch table chatting, instead of standing on a stage with thousands of people on a spotlight and a microphone, there was a whole lot of him that was still there. Uh, and so, and, you know, there were quips and uh, funny comments and pithy observations about uh, politics and entertainment and stuff. So I was pleasantly surprised at how much was still there. Um, I just got a notice from my sister, mm -hmm. Patty, that she can't see the interview. So it is apparently on your phone what? and my computer, and that's it. So, oh well next time maybe but uh we will just continue in an audio way but i don't have any visual aids anyway i wasn't going to hold up photographs or make zany faces so uh yeah perfect and i can download just the sound file for you as well that you can share with your sister but uh okay yeah oh they are gonna get it from me as soon as you know i find <laughs> out how to call them and let them know but live stream um, yeah, uh, it's actually StreamYard is what we use. Oh, and StreamYard, like I, said, right. I have never had an issue with this, and I can see you on my phone on Facebook. So we will get it figured out. But tell your sister I do apologize. Uh, she's right. not missing much with me, but she probably wants to see <laughs> well, her. She's, and she's, she's semi-familiar with me and my story as well. So she's probably not the best uh, uh, average citizen. But we will continue. We are <laughs> intrepid. We will push forward. Absolutely. We're already here. So, oh, wow. Well, um, sure. So, yeah, that is interesting that, you know, when you see, you know, as we all get older, it's which is bound to happen. Um, you lucky. know, something that I think about a lot is the way that you think about older people through different periods of your life. Like I have to catch myself still referring to someone as middle-aged or yeah. something like, cause I'm like, fuck, no, he's my age. Um, you know, and then to, you know, to make an acquaintance like that with someone who is later in life and you see that, you know, on the inside, you know, the cogs are still working the yes. same way. The cogs are still working. And also it was very gratifying to me, despite the substantial age difference, because I was 20 and he was 84. Um, he realized that I wasn't just some uh, rock and roll listening, hippie, worthless guy, but that I knew all about the stuff that he was into and that he talked about that I could appreciate uh, George Gershwin and Irving Berlin, whom he knew as friends. It was strange to... Right. He, he called them him. George and Irv. Yes. Uh, and and so uh, he knew that, that uh, I was a kindred spirit. I, I mean, it, I remember one time he called me into his office and he peeled off a $20 bill and he said, uh, go down to the record store and get me some records. You know what I like. And don't forget to bring me back the change. And uh, the idea that he knew that I knew what he'd like was cool. Um, and then his friends 
you know, they initially thought, who's this young punk? But then it was really great when they would realize, because my brain was like this Rolodex of people. So I would meet them. It's like, oh, okay, Irving Brecker. He wrote At the Circus and Go West and co-wrote Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh, Nat Perrin. He worked on Monkey Business and Duck Soup and created the Adams Family. And they realized that I knew who they were. And uh, so we were able to comfortably chat about this and that. And now, of course, now that I'm, I won't say middle-aged because that would mean that I expect to live to 130, which is right. unlikely. Uh, now, when someone tells me uh, my granddaughter watched Monkey Business and laughed at Harpo or something, now I'm the old guy saying, it's very gratifying when some of the kids today appreciate what they did all those years ago. Uh, uh -huh. Now I'm the guy that needs reassuring that uh, they're not forgotten and lost forever. Yeah, that's that is cool. Um, yeah. Now I I'm guessing that probably some of his friends, maybe at first, uh, you had maybe a feeling out period because I I'm get you know you had mentioned the financial. Um, issues or discomfort that older people go through. But sadly, there are probably also, um, you know, younger people in your shoes who may have taken advantage of the situation or gotten into that situation without altruistic goals. Um, well, so did you have Aaron his friends Fleming that maybe were testing? Erin Fleming would be the prime example of that because she was a struggling actress and was initially hired as his secretary, but she really wanted to try to use that to ride Groucho's coattails and initially further her acting career. And then she wanted to be a producer. And she really, I think at the expense of Groucho's health, unfortunately, was willing to push him into things that he might not have been uh, strong enough to handle because she wanted to share the spotlight with him. And I think she just, she refused to accept uh, his mortality. I don't mean his death, but I mean the fact that being a living legend doesn't mean you don't get hardening of the arteries and have strokes and heart problems and so on. So she, her ambition is what fueled her participation there. And, um, you know, she was her own worst enemy. She also had deep psychological problems, which help explain but not excuse her her abusive behavior. And it was just, re she was really tough to deal with because she had a mercurial personality. And are the cops coming to pick you up? I don't. I hope not. They drove huh. right by. Oh yeah, they don't even know where I am now. No, because they can't see you camera. unless they have your phone. Right. Uh, right. So we're good. Uh, uh, Aaron's. Yeah, she. It may explain, but doesn't excuse the way she treated him. And uh, I mean, it's a complex situation because she was also devoted to him at a time when his family had other priorities and they, you know, his, his grown children weren't interested in looking after him on a daily basis. And she was willing to put in the time and the effort, but she made his last years a rockier road than I think they deserved to be. But uh, the things that you thought would send her into a fury and a rage she would shrug off and laugh. And then other things that you would thought were completely innocuous, she would throw things and slam the door and scream and stomp around. And so there was no way to second guess her reaction to something. And it was really, it was tough, but I, you know, I, I suppose I reserved the right to leave at any point, but I, I really didn't want to miss anything for better or for worse. And whatever I could provide as a buffer, you know, the people in, in the household, uh, nurses and cooks and so on, all had his best interests at heart, which I did as well. 
And so I wasn't interested in abandoning him and I wasn't interested in missing out. I'm always the last to leave at a party because I'm afraid the really cool thing will happen right after the door clicks and I drive off. So I mm -hmm. stuck it out till till the end. Yeah. Um, it's like, do you ever watch The Simpsons? I, I, I haven't lately, but I certainly did uh, for a long time. All right. Yeah, I remember there was one episode where Marge and Homer are in a room and there's a whole bunch of like karate guys. And there's one that is like, you, you know, looks like Bruce Lee. You can tell like if shit goes down, he's the guy you want. And like a fight breaks out and this Bruce Lee guy is just standing there and Marge is like, Homer, we should go. He's like, but that guy hasn't done anything yet. And then they walk out and you hear this, hi -ya, ya ya wah <laughs> And he's like, oh. So, yeah, I definitely, yeah, you don't want to miss anything, especially, you know, like you had said, that was, Christ, it was a dream job for you. There was always something. There, there was never a day that I drove away from there and thought, well, that was crashingly dull. Because, mm -hmm. the, the, as I say, I never... I never took it for granted or became jaded about, ah, oh, I guess I'll go over to Groucho Marx's house and have lunch with them prepared by a gourmet chef and look through the letters that Harry Truman and Irving Berlin sent him. And not see the cops realize that they passed your place. Uh, they I went just, again I a little it. slower. On my screen, there was a pop-up that said, great show, guys from yes. uh, one of my Facebook peeps. Yes, so that, that was a comment that came in. I don't know if he's able to see it, but yeah. uh, assuming he didn't just have that message pre-prepared to send in regardless of what we were talking about, uh, someone is out there listening for God's sakes. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so, you know, how... You said you this kind of never. You said you were there for three years, and this never became a chore. No. Uh, and and my my um, responsibilities you know, shifted, was it? so it wasn't just the same thing. I mean, I worked, I helped on a few of the books that Groucho did in his last years, the Groucho File, which is like an illustrated history of his life. I worked with Hector R.C on the, the secret word is Groucho, which is the behind the scenes story of You Bet Your Life. So I was there to help interview George Fenneman and the band leader and the writers from the show. Uh, and then towards the very end, I, I was uh, actually, uh, there was a, a big fight over Groucho between the Aaron Fleming faction and then Arthur Marks, who was Groucho's son uh, and the Bank of America, and they were both fighting over control of him. And mm -hmm. the temporary conservator was Nat Perrin, who had a, a legal background in addition to the fact that he was one of Groucho's oldest friends. And he was someone both sides uh, could respect and, and trust his judgment. And he actually asked me to stay at the house on the weekends to sort of referee the different factions, which was a, you know, I realized how far I had come <clears throat> from this kid who was tickled pink that Aaron Fleming had talked to him on the phone and said that she would bring Groucho to UCLA. And ultimately I was put in a position of having to say to Aaron, it's eight o'clock, it's time for you to go now. Uh, wow. And I remember her on the phone to one of her friends screaming, fucking servants are treating me like a cockroach. <laughs> very flattering. <clears throat> yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was very strange that this kid that, I mean, she, I will always be grateful to her for having hired me. If she hadn't said, would you like to work for Groucho, you know, in his house, it wouldn't have happened. Groucho wasn't going to call me and say, you're a very fine young fellow. And I, so I, I'll never begrudge her that, but mm -hmm. you know, we were getting down to who was best for him, you know, health wise and mentally and, and uh, who was looking out for him. And she had become, you know, detrimental to that. 
And yet we also worried about that removing her would be uh, like taking someone off of heroin cold turkey and that that might be too traumatic for him as well. So it was a very delicate situation. But my, my responsibilities advanced the longer I stayed there and got into, as I say, helping to not co-author, but helping a lot with research and collating material for the books. And then, you know, on weekends, refereeing the traffic as people came to say hello or essentially goodbye to Groucho in his last months. Yeah. Um, so how did your tenure with Groucho end? It wasn't tenure. It was three year. Bop, 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 bop. Yeah. Uh, it ended with his death. Um, and, and I, I, he died on a Thursday and I figured, well, there's no reason for me to come in on, on the weekend now, but, uh, they said that I should anyway, uh, if only to just have someone inside the house to handle inquiries and all that. And the thing was, <clears throat> no one had clued me in on any kind of service or funeral uh, you know, there was such bitterness between Aaron's friends and Arthur's friends that there wasn't even any central service. And it's funny, well, bitterly funny. Um, Arthur didn't trust me because he saw me as one of Aaron's minions. And Aaron had her falling out with me when she realized that I so disapproved of how she treated Groucho because I had given a three-day deposition in a law, law office in Century City mm -hmm. and it became clear what my feelings about her were and they were similar to what I'm saying now which is there's all the positive stuff that she was devoted to him that I owe her my job and all that stuff but also detailing screaming at him and and making him cry and uh, making his blood pressure go up and all that so she didn't like me at the end and Arthur had never trusted me. Uh, so I wasn't clued in on what happened. And I remember one of Groucho's friends, um, Betty Comden of the team of Comden and Green who wrote the scripts for Singing in the Rain and Bandwagon, a lot of great Broadway musicals. She called and she said, um, is Aaron there? And I said, no. She said, is Arthur there? And I said, mm -hmm. no. She said, I, I don't know who to console. And I said, I guess we should console ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that was how a lot of us were left uh, with our own memories and feelings. There wasn't really any kind of public place to say goodbye. Um, but then that, that became my, in, in August of 77, that was my official last last weekend there and uh and it was you know i had spent so much time thinking this is it this is it <clears throat> he's mm -hmm. fading out uh i mean even i guess it was just a few weeks into my working there when i'd finally gotten comfortable <clears throat> and i rang the bell and the the maid answered and said please be quiet mr marx has had a stroke and i thought oh man the the coach is turning back into a pumpkin already. <clears throat> and she said, uh, he, he's asking for you. And I went down the hall and I expected to see him lying on his bed near death and not making sense. And instead he was propped up in bed reading the LA Times. He had his beret and his mucklucks on. <laughs> and he looked up and he said, is the ambulance here yet? And I said, no, it figures. And so it's like, oh, yeah, another stroke. I've had these before. But I, I was the one that had kind of freaked out and thought, this is it. It's, the curtain is descending. And yeah. the nurse at the time wanted me to help uh, get him around because he was having trouble walking. And he managed to spring back from that, astonishingly. It really didn't, that one didn't take its toll. But there were so many times when I thought, ah, okay, the other times were false alarms. This time, this is it. This is it. And then he would bounce back from it and continue to say funny things and and uh, pithy observations. And then I would get you know lulled into that false sense of security again until the next emergency happened. 
So I knew, you know, I don't know if you've had to deal with an elderly relative, but there is that point where you think, I hate to say this, but I think he might be better off just sailing off into the big sleep. Uh, sure. I from, have... a, from a selfish standpoint, you just want it to go on forever. Or even like, you know, taking a pet to the vet to be put to sleep. How do you pick that day when you say, I have to take her in and say goodbye to her. And it was similar in this case where uh, some mature part of my brain said, his, what is his quality of life at this point? Um, but I didn't want it to end. So there was, I mean, I was sad, but there was a sense of finality and, you know, altogether fitting and proper that, you know, he, he wasn't aware of the contentious fight going on over him uh, towards the end. He was spared that. And, uh, you know, he, he had a remarkable life, all things considered. Uh, you know, he didn't, he wasn't fabulously wealthy, but he had a few million dollars when he died. Chico died broke. Um, Harpo did all right. Um, uh, he had, Groucho was divorced three times and envied Harpo being married once, and it was a very happy marriage with uh, a flock of adopted children. And he envied that, but he seemed to, all. he said, I married my wives for their beauty. They had nothing upstairs except another man from time to time. <clears throat> and it's true, his wives got younger and prettier, but it, he wasn't picking them really for the the personality companionship, someone to talk to and knock ideas around with, he had, as I say, a kind of Victorian approach to women, you know, but uh, the kitchen well, he and was the bedroom. Renting. He what was renting, think? not buying. Huh? He was looking to rent and not buy. Well, but he bought thrice and paid dearly for them. For sure. Sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when did you decide to write a book or did you decide early on and when did you start writing the book? Well, for years, people would meet me, <clears throat> we'd have lunch or we'd be conversing and I would tell them some little facet of my work there, some story or observation or someone I met or something like that. And they'd say, "You, God, that's you ought to write a book about it. And I would think that that would be so arrogant of me to think that I had a book's worth of things to say because I was such a postscript to his life. I mean, he was essentially retired and in fading health. And uh, how could I possibly fill a book with that? And then I, I got to thinking, well, maybe if I jot down some of the more interesting stories, I might be able to turn that into an article for Vanity Fair or Esquire or something like that. So I sat down, I, I had a lifelong interest in archeology span and history. So I basically sat down to try to recreate the sequence of chronological events from being a Groucho fan to seeing him at the Dorothy Chandler to meeting him and the UCLA thing and getting the job and the ups and downs. And I, uh, you know, I went through copies of old letters and notes that I had taken. I would, I would often, if he would say something at the lunch table, <clears throat> I would race into my room and jot it down, not for posterity's sake, but so that I could zip a piece of paper in my typewriter when I got home and send a letter to a friend saying, here's something funny Groucho said. And I, I say, I still have that yellowing clump of scrap papers on a on a rusty paper clip and it would say you know this guy came in and said you know how do you and, yeah he was particularly merciless with reporters who didn't really know much about him uh i remember some reporter was interviewing him and he he treated the guy to a song and the guy said that's wonderful uh where did you learn to sing and Groucho said, I've been singing all my life. Where did you learn to write? Or maybe you haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, that didn't make it into the guy's piece, by the way. No, um, I believe that. So I just sort of, and, and then I realized this is going to be longer than a, an article. And then I worried that it would be too long for an article and too short for a book. I'd end up with like a 50-page novella or something. I don't know what it was. 
But lo and behold, it did turn out to be long enough for a book. And friends would say, I'm sure you'll have no problem getting this published because it's an inside look at one of the legends of entertainment. Um, and I'm sure they'll be clamoring for it. <clears throat> and, you know, cut to an avalanche of rejection slips initially. And I, uh, my cover letter to the, initially to agents and then to publishers said, this is not a biography of Groucho Marx. This is the story of a fan whose dream came true and getting close to his hero and his twi. And I would get rejection slips that said, a thank you for your submission, but we are not interested in any Groucho Marx biographies at this time. And mm -hmm. it was very frustrating, but ultimately I found an agent and a publisher <clears throat> and that was in 96. And that's when the hardcover came out. And then, and I, and Dick, my, my friend Dick Cavett did the introduction and I got wonderful blurbs. Woody Allen said it was one of the best books about a show business icon he'd ever read, which was hard for me to grasp. Mm. Steve Allen, Jack Lemmon um, gave me dust jacket blurbs. And, uh, and then uh, about seven or eight years ago, I thought about, uh, someone approached me about putting it out in paperback, and I thought this will give me a chance to revise and update on some of the people that I talked about and events that happened in the like 15 years since the hardcover had come out. So I did an extra chapter at the end that caught people up on all of these you know, fascinating characters that I had talked about then. Sometimes it was the people's reaction to the book itself and uh, people who had passed away since the book came out or experiences I had like going into Groucho's house when it was for sale and it had been so massively reworked structurally that it really wasn't the house I'd been in anymore. And I felt like a ghost haunting his old house. It was very strange walking through and I <clears throat> I felt like I was there with a, a friend of mine and uh, Mike Rowe, very funny writer, producer. And uh, he was the one that told me about it. And he said, let's go be looky lose. So we're walking through there and I felt like a, like a blind psychic or something. And I'm saying, this wall wasn't here. This was Groucho's bedroom. That was a that wall was a bathroom. This was the den. There was a sliding door there because I could see it all vividly in my mind, and it had been so changed that it really, you know, it was designed in the fifties by a very famous, at the time, architect named Wallace Neff, who did a lot of celebrity houses, and that are now considered mid-century modern. But the, you know, at the time, they were just new. Mm -hmm. um, but it has been so reworked that trying to sell it again as a Wallace Neff designed house, I think is unethical because it had been changed so much. So it was very strange being back there. Um, anyway, so then, so I have this revised and expanded edition that can be found on Amazon in Kindle. Also, I did the, the uh, audio book doing all the voices, big surprise. And if anyone is interested in having a signed or personalized copy of the book, they can order one from my website, Steve Stolier, S-T-O-L-I-A-R, yes, dot com. And I would be happy to sign and send a copy of the book. Otherwise, as I say, Amazon has, has it in the three different floor mats. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> um yeah so so you didn't start writing the book until he had passed but obviously oh, the idea until, was there no it was like 20 years later oh okay which, but that gave me a, a great perspective on it because i had accomplished other things that was another thing that that concerned me was that as more time elapsed after groucho's death i came to think you know, like with Orson Welles and Citizen Kane, did I peak at 20 something? And that's all I'll be known for. And that's my only contribution. 
and the rest of my life is just downhill and that's the only thing I have to call. But by the time I wrote it, I had uh, moved to New York and written for Dick Cavett and I'd written episodes of Murder, She Wrote and Simon and Simon and other TV shows. And it was able to take its place in perspective. It's still uh, a landmark moment in my life that changed it because I had been a history major when I got the job and then I switched at UCLA to motion picture television with an interest in writing. Um, so it, it changed my life, but I, need, I needed to accomplish more things so that I wasn't only seen as this guy that when he was 20 worked for Groucho, even though I understand that that shall we say, raises eyebrows when people find out that this guy knew Groucho Marx, just as I marveled that he knew W.C. Fields and <clears throat> George Gershwin. And, and I got to know the other two brothers who were still alive, Zeppo and Gummo, who lived in Palm Springs. Chico and Harpo had died years earlier. Um, and I have the distinction of saying that Zeppo and I dated the same girl. She was 19, I was 20, and he was 74. <laughs> and it was, he, I had brought her to dinner at Groucho's once when Zeppo was up from Palm Springs, and he took a liking to her. She was young and had a great personality, very bright, uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. And then when she and I broke up, I had a couple of photos I wanted Zeppo to sign, so I sent them to him and my letter, I said, by the way, Linda and I broke up if you have any advice for the lovelorn, because I knew he'd been around the track a few times. <clears throat> and instead of just getting the photos back, my phone rings. I didn't even think he had my phone number, so he must have called Aaron Fleming and saying, Steve is Zeppo, Mox. Uh, I hope I'm not bothering. No, hi. Uh, listen, uh, I, I don't want to step on your toes. Uh, I wouldn't want to do anything that would upset you, you understand. Mm -hmm. But do you think that Linda would go out with me? Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is really weird. I was asking him for advice, and he's hitting on her. And yeah. I said, I, uh, I, 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 she got a kick. I, I'll have to ask her. So I asked her, and she thought it was kind of strange and interesting, too, and worth it for the experience. So she said, okay. And uh he took her to dinner in San Diego and then to a Hialeah game in Tijuana. I guess wow. that was Zeppo's standard first date, was dinner in San Diego and a Hialeah game in, in Tijuana. But he said, Steve, I want you to know I never even kissed her. You <laughs> understand? She was very nice, but all she did was talk about herself. And then I saw her on campus and she said, Zeppo was very nice, but all he did really was talk about himself. And I thought, a very interesting pairing. And then after that, if I were at a party at Groucho's and Zeppo was there, he would introduce me and say, and this is Steve. He's a nice guy. Uh, he and I dated the same girl, but he got further with her than I did. That was like That's my awesome. full title. Yeah. So I have the distinction. And, and as you may sometimes hear, uh, Zeppo really did have a hell of a personality and sense of humor. It didn't get to show itself in the Paramount films he did. Uh, he just wasn't given funny material, mostly because by the time he joined the act in vaudeville, the three main characters of Chico Harpo and Chico were pretty set. So the, the idea of the straight man isn't really to get the laughs. Mm -hmm. um, but he himself had a great sense of humor and uh, became a very successful agent after he left after Duck Soup. He ended up representing uh, Lana Turner and Lucille Ball and Barbara Stanwyck and Robert Taylor and Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. So he thrived actually after, he wasn't, he was never happy getting such short shrift as one of the Marx brothers. As a, ma as a matter of fact, I actually met him before Groucho because my friend and I were in the parking structure of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion after the Groucho show. And I looked over and I recognized Zeppo because I'd seen recent pictures of him in the press. And I thought, well, I'll never meet Groucho, but I'm gonna meet a Marx brother. Hmm. So I went over and I said, excuse me, Mr. Marx, I just wanted you to know how much 
I enjoyed you in your pictures. And he said, you weren't enjoying me. You were enjoying my brothers. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's what a sweet response to my compliment. Thank you so much. <laughs> but he was considerably nicer when I met him at Groucho's and I was with my girl. He said, you know, uh, you and Linda ought to come visit me in Palm Springs sometime. And I said, I don't know. I was there when I was like eight or nine and it was sweltering. And he said, well, when were you there in the summer? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, well, you know, Steve, it's cold in Alaska during the winter too. Yeah, so that he was, is. He was cute. Yeah, that is true. Um, yeah, that is very cool. So after, you know, this stint, um, working with Groucho, you said you ended up writing for television. Um, right. how, how did that go? Was you know, well, I initially, a few actually, years later when Groucho, when he was fading out, my job had gotten to be more part time, and I had graduated from college, and I I needed a steadier job, even though I was still working for Groucho. So I got a job in the steno pool at Universal from 11 to eight every day, strange hours, and all day long typing Rockford Files, Columbo, Kojak. Um, I mean, it was, it was interesting and I love being on the lot. I mean, on my lunch hour, I would just go wandering around the different sound stages and think about what had been shot there. They still had the Phantom of the Opera balcony seats from the Lon Chaney Senior silent wow. phantom of the opera so i loved it and then you know if there were i would check the shooting schedules and see what kind of guest stars were on some of the shows i didn't care much about the then current stars like lindsey wagner and lee majors and but they would get guest stars so i got to meet fred astaire on the set of <laughs> Battlestar Galactica of all the unlikely things. I got mm -hmm. to meet Lauren Bacall on the set of The Rockford Files because she was guest starring. So I was just, you know, and I would just soak it up. And then really it was, it was Dick Cavett that gave me my break because he and I started corresponding when I was working for Groucho. <clears throat> and then when Groucho died, I figured he would sever his connection to me because why would this erudite Yale graduate talk show host intellectual want to stay in touch with me if the pipeline to Groucho's had closed? And instead he mm -hmm. called me up the week Groucho died and he said, listen, I hope just because Groucho's gone, we're not going to lose touch. And by the way, I hope you don't mind, but I've shown some of your letters to Woody and he says they're very well written. <laughs> so I emptied the urine out of my shoes and uh, <laughs> and that began this correspondence. And he was the one that hired me. I was working as a production secretary at Universal. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can cut that out later. Absolutely. We'll get it I out. Don't want people, I don't want people to know that I've cleared my throat in real life. I want them to think that I've never done that. Nope, anyway. We'll take care of it in post for sure. Yes. Um he hired me to write for him at HBO in New York. And I made the, you know, that quantum leap around the, uh, the desk from being a secretary to being a person with a secretary and, uh, stayed in New York for two and a half years, which was a marvelous experience. I just, I had had felt such a connection to the whole New York, you know, the Algonquin round table crowd and Broadway and all that. So I loved that, but then work was drying up there. And I ended up getting an offer from my former boss, Bill Dial, um, to write for him on a new show he was producing. And that necessitated moving back to California, which I didn't really want to do. Um, I remember when the Mayflower people, I don't mean the pilgrims, I'm not that old. The people oh, from okay. the Mayflower Moving Company were packing me up in LA to move to New York. And they couldn't understand why anyone would move to New York. They're only familiar with people going in the other direction. And I sorely wanted to stay there um, because I love the atmosphere, but work was drying up and it's an expensive place to live. So when I got this offer, which was a lot of money and in LA, there really wasn't a decision to be made. So I 
rolled back into LA and I've been here ever since. And that led to, you know, you make connections and you write stuff and people read this and hire you for that. And so I've done a variety. I mean, now I've, I've produced documentaries on a wide variety of pop culture subjects and, and tend to get pulled in if there's a Marx Brothers documentary or something like that. And I've written a few pieces for The Hollywood Reporter. I've done a lot of voiceover work for cartoons and radio and narration, impressions and things like that. Um, and I co-wrote the memoir of a very interesting fellow named Howard Storm, who was a stand-up and then a very successful TV director. He did the first three years of every episode of Mork and Mindy. And so he's filled with great stories about Robin Williams and growing up in the Lower East Side with gangsters and all this stuff. So we wrote a book called The Imperfect Storm that came out recently. And uh, that was a really pleasant um, collaboration because uh, he and I were friends to begin with. And... Um, so, you know, I've managed to keep, and uh, my book, my Raised Eyebrows, has been optioned to be made into a motion picture, really? which, uh, and, it's, and again, as with my cover letter on the book, is not a Groucho Marx biography. It just focuses on the, that, that three-year period when, uh, you know, it's about this young, impressionable kid and his aging hero, and then this ambitious, difficult woman. And so it's really almost entirely on the, on the inside of Groucho's house. It's not expanded into any look at his, his entire life or anything like that. But it's been optioned, and there's a script that I co-wrote, and we were getting financing and had a director attached to, I can't mention just yet, um, and then, of course, the coronavirus hit right. and everything was put on hold. You know, there's a clause in contracts called force majeure that my one time boss, Bill Dial, called force manure. Mm -hmm. That's that's basically says if it's through no fault of any human, an act of God, uh, uh, something like that, then it will, you know, put a stop on the option clock uh, temporarily. And so that's what, you know, because everyone had to sequester. Right. Um, but once that, you know, things start getting closer to what passes for normal, uh, we will resume and hopefully uh, have a move. And it's going to be very strange to see someone playing me at yeah. 20 with mutton chops and a full head of hair and a mustache. And of course, no one will care if it really looks like me. I remember talking to Woody Allen about casting possibilities some years back. And he said, and you, nobody knows what you look like. You could get Orlando Bloom to play you. But no, <laughs> it will not be Orlando Bloom. But uh, well, you never know. So, so I'm, you know, I'm keeping busy and, and I'm very proud of my Groucho years. But since I've accomplished other things, I don't have that nagging feeling that I peaked at 20 and that it's just been this downhill slide ever since then. Right. You're not proof rock, right? I grow no. old. I grow old. Yeah. Yes. Alfred. Uh, well, that's great. Steve, it was very nice meeting you, uh, hearing your story. I know we've been going back and forth by email for a little yeah. bit. Um, I apologize well, for the technical issues. Well, that well, I don't hold you personally responsible, but I'm glad that some of the little messages we've been getting indicate that people have been hearing and, by golly, actually seeing this. So yes, uh, maybe I'll have to watch it and, <laughs> and see what you look like. I don't know. I, I don't know if you'll see me. A man I, of I, mystery. Yeah, I don't think you'll see me, but that's fine. Oh. Uh, I can certainly send you the link and. Um, you know, I appreciate your interest. Definitely. Uh, sure. I hope people will check out the book and I'm going to put that link up one more time. So if they want to get it signed, uh, you will oh. sign it for them. And um, definitely I've got your info. Uh, keep in touch. Let us know 
how things are going and uh, definitely looking forward to that movie getting made. Yeah, me too. That'll be something. Awesome. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Be, be well. You're more it than welcome, whatever that you. means. Yeah. I've never understood what that means, but people say it. You're more than welcome. What does that mean? I owe you money? I don't know what that means, but you are more yeah, than yeah. welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Have a great day, Steve. Adi